Hello and a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantye. Coming up on our program this week, a record number of women are running in Lebanon's upcoming parliamentary elections. This is the first vote for the embattled political establishment in almost 10 years. The artists fighting censorship amid a crackdown by Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Turkey's president continues to tighten his grip on power. Also coming up, I sit down with Susan Mycelis at the Jeux de Pomme Museum here in Paris to talk about her Kurdistan series in the shadow of history. The project has been some three decades in the making. All these stories coming up, but first to Lebanon, where the first parliamentary poll in almost a decade is fast approaching. Ahead of the May 6th vote, the country has been swept into election fever with posters plastered on every wall, as well as televised debates. This time, a record-breaking number of women are running. Our team on the ground has met some of them. Let's have a look. Among the rows of men sitting in the Lebanese parliament, there are only four women but that might not be the case for long. In the country's first parliamentary election in nine years, more than 80 women are running for a seat. Jumana Haddad is one of them, a journalist and a writer who's known for her outspokenness in support of women and freedom of speech. She's running as an independent candidate. Independent candidates, especially women, have limited funds. Women are told from a young age that it's only men who are concerned in politics. I submitted my candidacy to prove that it's time for women and independent candidates to have a voice in parliament. Another woman in the race is Rola Tabasha Rudi. She's a candidate for the Future Movement Party and already a familiar face in parliamentary committees through her work as a lawyer. Throughout my career, I've worked on developing our laws, especially the ones concerning women. It's not right that a parliament full of men is discussing laws that affect women. The last time Lebanon held parliamentary elections was in 2009. Back then, only 12 women ran for a place. This year, women represent more than 11% of the total number of candidates. Women are not half of society, they're the whole society. Women are equal to men and they can do well in politics. Political inheritance is common in Lebanon. Women used to gain a parliamentary seat by taking over from their father or husband on account of a good family name. It's up to this election and the women running for it to buck that trend. Turning our attention to Turkey, where Recep Tayyip Erdogan has continued to cement his grip on power since the failed coup attempt in 2016. Now, over the past two years, some 60,000 people have been arrested, much to the dismay of the international community and rights groups. As Erin Ogonkwe explains, the crackdown has sent many artists underground. Reconciling artistic creation and growing political censorship is no easy task. Group Urum, a popular music collective, works out of a discreet studio in this Istanbul neighborhood. The politically active group, close to the far left, is a fierce critic of President Erdogan. Their concerts, which marry traditional music and lyrical protest, often overflow with fans. That is, before the arrests of the group's lead singers over the past 10 months. 10 members of the group are in jail and arrest warrants have been issued for many others. The government wants to keep us quiet, but we won't be silenced. For the Turkish government, these musicians are not artists, but terrorists. Some of the members' names appear on a government list of individuals sought by police. Their photos alongside those of jihadists. 60,000 euros are offered to anyone willing to report them. The police regularly make strong-handed appearances at their studio. Ever since the attempted coup d'etat in July 2016, President Erdogan has justified increased limits on freedom of speech and ramped up arrests. The now almost two-year-long state of emergency permits authorities to censor seemingly innocent expressions of art, a tendency that's led this pop singer to keep a low profile. He's censored by the National Turkish Radio just like 200 other singers, and all because of a line in one of his songs about happiness. While dancing, we spilled wine on the table, he sings. But the government sees the reference to wine as an incitement to alcoholism. I can't do anything about it, but it's absurd that in 2018 there's censorship of a line about wine. 
It affects peaceful coexistence. Before, religious people who didn't drink alcohol lived alongside those who did. But these restrictions fracture society. The heavy hand of censorship has also made its way to theater, which hundreds of actors recently protested. They say the crackdown on stage has been particularly harsh. Artists are supposed to show the path to enlightenment and offer a source of hope, but we don't have much hope left. What will become of Turkey in five or ten years, we have no idea. According to the United Nations, the state of emergency has led to the arbitrary restrictions on the human rights of hundreds of thousands of people in Turkey. Now, we end this week's show with a tete-a-tete -tete with Susan Meiselis, an American documentary photographer who's currently showing her Kurdistan series at Jeux de Pomme Museum here in Paris. This exhibition includes very powerful accounts of Kurds persecuted under the Saddam regime and more broadly speaking across the region in Iran, Turkey and Syria. Susan's been following the Kurdish course since 1991 and I went to see her earlier this month to discuss both her work as well as the ongoing Kurdish predicament. You've essentially been working on this uh, project since 1991. This is mm. not a show that's been put together by mere weeks or months of uh, mm. work. You must have developed a very strong relationship with the Kurdish people. Well, in a sense, it was very progressive. I didn't know when I left New York. I barely knew where Kurdistan was. So in 1991, which was just after the second Gulf War, so after the insurrection, the Saddam, Saddam's troops had retreated to Baghdad. I actually flew to Iran, to Tehran, and then I came in across the border of Haji Omran. And what was interesting at that moment is Daniel Mitterrand was meeting with the Kurds on the border, on the frontier. And when she left, I went into northern Iraq. So that was my first entry, and I, of course, documented the photographs here. I documented the Anfal, the 4,000 villages. Of course, I didn't see them all, but I saw a lot of rubble on all the hills and documented what I could. And, of course, the next stage really was quite important, was this idea that how could you tell this history through photography, through the century of photography, you know, of a people without a homeland that's secure, Etc. So it's a long time. 25 years of engagement, and you have a combination of what we're seeing around here as your own photographs, short films, behind us, words and testimonies by the Kurdish community themselves. Is it because you felt that one format of art potentially wouldn't do this story justice? Yeah, I, in a sense, you know, because my photographs were of, of the present, but actually documenting the past because I wasn't seeing the action in, in a sense. It had happened several years before I arrived. So the Anfal campaign was 88, 89, which was an attempt to exterminate the Kurds, which I had read about, but I hadn't seen any evidence. So I went with this mission in my mind of visual evidence. So whether it's the villages that are destroyed and some of the refugees living in the ruins or Tamor's back with a bullet, wound, you know, that's now a scar, or it's the clothing on the grave sites which were brought up as people searched for the, for the bodies of their kin. Each stage of that gathering of evidence, in a way, led to this other historical project. Now, you just mentioned that uh, there is a video here of a young man that gives a testimony of what was done to him by the forces of Saddam Hussein. It's extremely jarring. I was shaken by this. Was that the intention behind this exhibition, to enable the spectator not just to see what's happening here, but also to feel what the Kurds have gone through over the past decades? If possible. <laughs> it's always a challenge to connect, even through photographs, through video, through storytelling. This room has many, many different layers of entry. You know, so where it begins for people who come from afar and have no sense, even though they might read headlines every day, certainly today, and when we opened the exhibit in February, the Turks were invading Afrin, and there were, was terrible news, as there still is. But what brings us closer? You know, so that's the challenge. I want to talk about these books, the laminated books mm. behind us. You worked with 
the Kurdish community here in Paris to make them. What was behind that decision beyond the obvious? Just before this exhibit opened, about a week before, at the Kurdish Institute of Paris, it was an open call to anyone who felt from any part of the Kurdish community that would like to, to contribute a story. And we worked for a very intense weekend, actually two, three days, to try and capture something of a small part of a large history that individuals carry within them. So to find a few photographs to complement the story or start with a photograph and then build a story, we worked together, and there were about 10 stories that came just before the exhibition. Now, Susan, you talk about this being an ongoing project, and of course, the Kurdish predicament is mm. something that uh, mm. seems to have no end in sight. Of course, last year, they held this independence referendum. They yeah. were pushed into backing out by the central government in Baghdad and other countries in the region. Yeah. Do you have any hope for this community mm. at some point having their own homeland? You have to have the hope. They have the hope. We all have to have the hope of, first of all, protection of a region, you know, an integrated region, you know, not necessarily an isolated region. I mean, the tensions in the neighborhood, as it were, are tremendously difficult. People, I fear, will continue to fight in this generation for a future. Susan Meisel, mm -hmm. thank you very much for speaking to us here on France 24. Well, that's it from us this week. Don't forget, if you have any suggestions, you can always reach out to us on Facebook. That's Middle East Matters France 24 and Twitter. Do stay tuned.